The year may have just started, but 2020 is off to a great start for horror fans. We have a promising lineup for games and movies, and Netflix delivered us the gift that is Archive 81. Without much advertising or a marketing campaign, this show took fans by surprise. It has great writing, a premise filled with unsettling twists, and a high budget. While the show may be heavenly, its characters are morally ambiguous at best. But who among them is good, and who is truly evil? Welcome to Blood Binge. Today we'll be ranking Archive 81 characters from good to evil. As usual, we'll be breaking up the characters into three categories. The good, the gray area, and the bad to evil. And a small note, we won't be including Kalego in the list. Obviously, the demonic deity capable of ending our world as we know it is a shoe in for most evil, but we don't actually know a whole lot about him or his capabilities. So for this video, we'll be sticking to the human cast. With all that said, let's begin. As usual, we'll be starting with the most noble character and working our way down. These are characters who, despite confusion and dire circumstances, try to make sure that we're living in the better of two worlds. These are the good. Taking the gold medal of good is Mark Higgins. Many members of the audience may have overlooked the best friend, sidekick, and bona fide Google man, Mark. The characters certainly did. But we did have our eye on his selflessness the entire time. Although Mark doesn't have the flashiest moments of altruism in the show, he is our ideal candidate for a good character. No one here is perfect, but he shows consistent moral values and goes above and beyond to help in a wide variety of circumstances. There are examples of this both shown and told to us. We get to hear about some of his big moments of heroism, such as getting his friend Daniel into a care clinic after his breakdown. You let me know if you're feeling low again, right? And even using his father's ample resource to foot the bill. Time and time again, we're shown how little thought he puts into running errands for Dan and helping him investigate a weird situation, even as it gets increasingly unbelievable. He demonstrates loyalty by refusing to spy on Dan and by calling out Dan's ex. Finally, we know his motivations for doing this are good. When Dan mistakes his friend's helpful actions as being for the podcast, Mark is not afraid to set him straight. He speaks up for himself and makes it clear that he cares about Dan and his survival, not his show. Standing up for himself like he stands up for his friends is just one of the reasons that we love Mark and see him as a beacon of light on the show. Bringing home the silver medal of good is Jess. Jess Lewis does make her fair share of mistakes on the show. She willingly agrees to take part in a ritual that would have essentially ended the world had it been successful. It's my destiny to receive this blessing. No, it's not. Not to spoil the rest of the list for you, but she's actually the only member of the cult to make the good tier. Yeah, we did give her some leniency for her age, at 14, Jess has been groomed for this cult for pretty much her entire life. More importantly, she learns better. At the last minute, when she discovers the true nature of the ritual, she flees rather than to take part. This shows that despite a life of being misled, she's still capable of making the right decision. Because of her age and vulnerable situation, we found this incredibly impactful. The biggest reason why she takes second place on our ranking, however, is her heart. Had she not ever been involved with the cult or tried to push Melody away, she would have been a shoe in for the gold. The fact that the cult members are only able to trick her into helping due to her good and trusting nature is not lost on us either. The bronze medal of good goes to Melody Pendris. This just goes to show that being a good person at the core sometimes goes further than big dramatic actions. Melody doesn't always get it right. Like the entire cast of characters, she's flawed and prone to lapses in judgment. She can be overbearing, naive, and off-putting in her approach to personal goals. One of her biggest mistakes was taking Jess to a therapist without talking in person to Jess's mother first. Some smaller examples of her flaws include pretty much every recorded interview she gets, where she's awkward and single-minded. What starts off as a cool audio history project is quickly revealed to be little more than a guise to meet her mother. A mother who she's been told doesn't want anything to do with her. Despite these more selfish aspects of her character, Melody is an incredible person. The fact that she isn't perfectly altruistic by nature gives her a little something to overcome. Impressively, she often succeeds in this task. 
though her quest for her mother sometimes distracts her and motivates her more than the idea of helping, though she does always take time to help. The best example of this is probably her relationship to Jess, though sometimes she pushes the need to help too far. As we've already mentioned, she's always there when it matters. She looks out for a girl she feels is being neglected consistently, and when the time comes, she's even willing to put her own life on the line to save her. Get to the street as fast as you can, and then you'll run. Next up is our protagonist, Daniel Turner. This one was so, so close. We feel that his sacrifice to save Melody would have been enough to qualify him for a good medal on most lists. But the competition, as we've seen, was stiff. His fixation on helping the mysterious cinematographer may have started out as a self-indulgent mystery, but he saw it through to the point of endangering himself. She's trapped. I need to get her out. He does everything he can to aid this mysterious woman, putting her escape above his own in the final episode. One thing that does lose him points is that he is self-centered. It's almost as if he knows he's the protagonist of his own show, and expects everyone else to understand that as well. This character flaw is exemplified in the way that he treats his best friend, Mark, whom he takes for granted. You're not supposed to be here. I was worried. He shows no hesitation in asking for favor after favor, even lashing out sometimes at bad news and suggestions related to his search. There's also the matter of his temper. We're not saying that we would fare any better under such unprecedented supernatural circumstances, but he does have his fair share of outbursts while undertaking this project. Finally, rounding out our good tier is Steven Turner. We found him to be the most realistic, balanced character in this section. It makes him believable, grounded, and still a pretty decent person, though his dedication to logic means that he's not as helpful as he might have been to Melody. He eventually comes around. When realizing his mistakes, he goes out of his way, endangering his own life to help get her somewhere safe. Though this attempt was poorly executed to say the least, we don't doubt that his heart was in the right place by the end. Next up is the gray area. Here are the characters whose actions or intentions muddy the water between good and bad. While they're not contributing to the greater good, they're not actively working against it. First up in this tier is Bobby, aka Melody's mother. Like with characters in the previous tier, Bobby has good intentions. She's fighting for our world and also trying to protect her daughter. Unfortunately, her execution leaves so much to be desired. Abandoning Melody not only made her more susceptible to religious influences and dangerous cults, but left her with a lot of trauma. Having a high perception of the other place while growing up in a Catholic church was a terrible combination for her that left her totally unaware of the real danger she was in. Nor does Bobby seem to learn from her mistake. When Melody does get wrapped up with the cult and stranded in the other world, Bobby continues her method of lying and keeping secrets to rescue her. She adds a lot of stress and paranoia in Dan's situation instead of trying to help him understand or cope with the information. She does come through with a successful rescue of her daughter in the end, but the rushed nature of the mission almost certainly contributes to Dan's fate. Following her is Annabelle. Annabelle grows so much during these eight episodes. She may have the most drastic character transformation of the entire cast. When we meet her, she's annoying. Brazen, loud, and inconsiderate are all terms we'd feel comfortable using. She descends into further madness after being exposed to stardust. There's someone in there. The addictive mold makes her prone to spurts of violence and erratic behavior for which she is completely unapologetic. First, she intrudes on Melody's mission away from their apartment. Then, she can't take care of herself and ends up being a detriment to her world-saving timeline. When she shows up again to provide information to Mark and Daniel, we see that she isn't entirely there anymore, but she is as helpful as she is capable of being. Since the intention to help is buried somewhere in her character, we can't consider her bad. Overall, however, she is in the way more often than she is contributing. Next is Beatriz. Based on the company she keeps, we think she could be far, far worse than she is. She's one of the only truly friendly residents of the Visor, though she's introduced as a somewhat hokey-sounding psychic, she's reluctant to give doom-filled or negative readings. Don't take it literally. Death has many meanings. It also turns out that she's completely legitimate in her powers. She can not only read futures, 
but perform seances, which she does to try and comfort people who are hurting. We're not entirely forgiving her for being wrapped up with the multiple shady inhabitants of the building, or for the actions of her friends, but based on the little we see of her, we think her intentions are more pure than those of her peers. And rounding out this category is Mrs. Lewis. Strangely enough, she's not on here for cult activity. Mrs. Lewis, Jess's mother, is here for the treatment of her child. She's hardly the first woman to ever be misled by the church or leave her daughter largely to her own devices. Jess is 14 and capable, and her mother seems to be leaving her alone for work. Not anything nefarious. So some of this we could let slide thanks to circumstance. What is more difficult to forgive is the exorcism that she watched the priest perform on her sick child. Jess is prone to seizures, and being practically waterboarded is unlikely to make the situation any better. The only thing that spares Mrs. Lewis from the bad and evil section is that once Samuel intervenes, she ultimately agrees to see the father kicked out of her apartment rather than to let the abusive treatment continue any further. And finally, we arrive at the bad and the evil. These are characters whose actions just can't be forgiven in either world. First up is Cassandra. Unsurprisingly, you're going to be seeing a lot of cultists in this tier. Rather than bringing up each individual role within Voss, we're just going to cover the especially evil traits that each character has. In Cassandra's case, it's the manipulation of others. She's perfectly happy to ice out Melody, but takes a quick interest in Annabelle. From that point on, she's nice to Melody right up until she gets what she wants, Annabelle's addiction to the moldy paint. Once Annabelle starts painting, she immediately begins turning the two friends against one another, further isolating the woman she means to take advantage of. I knew she was special the moment I met her. While we sympathize with the loss of her partner, Eleanor, the fact that she is willing to ruin Annabelle's life for a few more paintings speaks volumes of her moral code, or lack thereof. Next is Tamara. She's a piece of work, isn't she? Cult activity and terrible operas aside, she just isn't likable. She's introduced to be quite interesting, but is never shown to have much of a personality. She's rude, selfish, and totally unaware of herself. These aren't huge sins, especially when you look at the actions of Voss's other members. Unlike them, however, she doesn't have redeeming qualities or the same sympathetic aspects to her backstory that makes us understand where she's coming from. All in all, she's unpleasant and harbors bad intentions. Rather than belabor the point, we'll move on to our next crazy character and bronze medal of evil winner, Virgil Davenport. We wouldn't be surprised if you had problems following the thread of Virgil's story, because he lies constantly. That's his first character flaw. We're not sure this man even knows the meaning of the word honesty. That information's confidential. Though it's a term he seems to throw around a lot. He's so comfortable layering on lie after lie, even when he knows he's going to be shortly found out. A prime example of this is when he tells Daniel during their interview that he didn't find anything on the background check to put him at ease. In that same interview, he reveals that he knows about Daniel's family being lost in the fire. You lost your family in a fire, isn't that right? He also lies by omission when describing the job. He lies about the tapes, his knowledge of them, their purpose, and his involvement from stage one. Their entire relationship is just Daniel peeling back layer after layer of the large deception. For someone who is constantly forcing these big reveals to happen, Virgil doesn't seem too keen on changing his own perception of things. His stubbornness with his brother's innocence and intentions with the ritual could easily have ruined everything, but he just refuses to see reason. Taking the silver medal of evil is Samuel. Though Iris plays a similar role to Samuel, recruiting and corrupting sacrifices for the cult in order to open the door between the two worlds, we feel we get to know Samuel better as a character. What makes him scary as a villain is that he believes he's right. Wholehearted dedication to an evil cause makes him damn near irredeemable. Not that he tried very hard to be redeemed. What makes him evil, truly evil, is the long game that he plays with everyone. He watches people that he thinks may be of use to him. He collects followers. He is never direct with his intentions. A great example of this is the way that he tricks Melody into coming to the visor by writing a fake letter from her mother to get her on that path. When she arrives, he plays innocent, staging a false meeting with her and actually hinting at the beginning of a romance. It's only once he's caught having sex with another member of Voss that he apologizes. 
though he says he's upset with himself for sleeping with an ex after asking Melody out. We have to wonder if he's more upset about getting caught, potentially ruining a stronger hold on his intended victim. Yet still, we think there is one worse character than him. The gold medal of evil goes to Father Russo. He's tied up in too many unsavory things. Though his role in summoning Kalego is more passive than Samuel's, Father Russo has his hands in many more shady dealings. Of all the plot threads, Russo's involvement both with the cult and the visor left the most loose ends. As such, we don't actually know the full intentions behind a lot of his actions. We know that he was tied up reading the same occult books as Samuel before being pushed in front of a train. We know that he was fully aware and complicit in the locking of Stardust addicted residents up on the sixth floor. We know that he was manipulating those same addicts with the as yet unfulfilled promise of a golden ticket. Of course, the greatest example of Father Russo's meddling is the exorcism scene. We've already talked about how horrific it was to watch an underage girl essentially tortured in her own home by a priest with her mother's consent, but we feel the need to clarify that most of the blame is on the priest. While he was, in a way, right about the evil present in the building, and even about the evil being in Jess as she had been poisoned, we don't think his actions were doing anything more than traumatizing the poor girl. The correct thing would have been to explain to the relevant people what he believed was happening. This would have been easier for him than any other character, as he already had their ear and trust. Ultimately, that's what we felt made him the most evil character on the show. Archive 81 deals with evil themes of lying, manipulation, and nefarious religions. Even though Father Russo was not directly responsible for Kalego's summoning, he finds less obvious ways to embody each of the show's three main evils. But what do you think? Which Archive 81 character do you think is the most evil? And who is the most heroic? Let us know in the comments section below. And make sure to subscribe to Blood Binge, where we satisfy your thirst for all things horror. Thanks for watching.